Yes. Yes. Because here's the coolest part about what we're up to. The whole point of my firm is to prove that you can have success through service. Actually, just let's start with today. What would you? What was the first thing you did when you woke up this morning? Uh, when I woke up this morning, I hit snooze on my alarm. That's the very first thing I did, and uh, and then I uh, got in my car after uh, doing the normal uh, kind of groggy, getting my uh, five minutes of meditation in, and um, putting my clothes on, and drove to spin and did uh, did my typical 40 minutes of spin in the morning, which woke me up and got me ready for the day. And then I drove to a, a client meeting where we were talking about uh, a big industrial uh, factory that we were helping them figure out whether they should stay in the same location, consolidate, they're growing rapidly. And so we did a, we did a visioning session for them uh, to help them figure out what they should do. And then I drove here and uh, am honored to be on this podcast with you. Well, we're excited for you to be here. And so, so you're, you're in commercial real estate and you've been yep. in it for a while, but you started okay. the company in 2013. I mean, what kind of led to those steps and why is your company a little bit different than the ones you're working for prior? Sure. So <clears throat> I'll take you back a little bit. So I was actually uh, raised a Christian missionary kid. My grandfather translated the Bible into Apache, uh, which was actually a very interesting thing because at the time, the Apache language wasn't even a written language. So not only do you translate the Bible into Apache, but in part of the process created the written Apache language uh, still to this day. Um, when I was a kid, we uh, were overseas. We lived in Papua New Guinea when I was a child. And I was taught from a very early age to love and serve and give and help and go above and beyond and do more for others and worry about yourself last. The problem was we were always poor and I hated being poor. And so deep within my psyche, when we came back from Papua New Guinea, that was the first time that it really hit me. Wow, all these other people and all these other kids have stuff and I don't have stuff. I want stuff. And so I decided at an early age that I was going to go get stuff and I wasn't going to follow in the, in the, the family business, so to speak, of missionary work. I was going to go make money. And so I get into commercial real estate after going to UCLA because I wanted to make money and I wanted to be successful. And a buddy of mine said I'd be good at it. And as soon as I get into commercial real estate brokerage, I realized really quickly, holy crap, this is a ruthless industry. Everybody's scratching and clawing and fighting and, uh, and I'm going, okay, if this is what it takes to be successful, don't want to be poor. My parents taught me to do the right thing, love, serve, give. But obviously that leads to boredom and I don't want to be poor. So I'm going to go do what these guys are doing and I'm going to be successful doing it. So I became Mr. Ruthless and take no prisoners and backstabbing and living without integrity and all the different things that I saw mirrored around me that I decided were necessary for success. And I was pretty good at it but I was miserable. I was misaligned, Kevin, with my core values. And, but I felt trapped. I didn't, I didn't know um, how to create success without behaving in that fashion. So fast forward, I'm six years into the business. I'm um, deeply unhappy. And I go to this, this, this conference and the speaker gets up and he starts having this talk about success by helping others. And I was fascinated, never heard anything like it. And so I tracked him down afterwards and I said, hey, is that just a shtick that you do? Is that just a cool thing that you say to uh, sound neat in front of people? And you're, because I've never heard that. And my experience is that's not possible. And he said, no, it's actually what I do. And uh, so I tracked, I tracked down one other guy that was doing it, had all these conversations. And what I ended up understanding was it was, a different way of doing business where instead of focusing on selling, you were focusing on serving. Instead of focusing on hunting, 
you were focusing on trying to uh, create long-term sustainable relationships and they locked it, they likened it to farming, to planting big trees. Like I have a citrus tree in my backyard, Kevin, and this citrus tree, it's a lemon tree. And when I first had it, this thing was the most annoying tree ever because it never produced any fruit. Today, after a lot of nurturing, a lot of watering, a lot of uh, pruning, this thing yields so many lemons that I have to throw half of them away every year. And that's the philosophy that he, he, that he taught me. He said, if you go out and hunt every day, you have to get up every morning and do it all over again. If you go out and serve and love and pay it forward with people, you create these long-term sustainable relationships that over time, they want to help you back. And so I fell in love with the concept. My first question to him was, if this works, then how come no one else is doing it, right? It seems so obvious. Like people don't really enjoy living in a shark tank. They don't really enjoy behaving ruthlessly and looking over their shoulder all the time. So why are they behaving in this fashion? And why does it, why are there, are, are if this is really possible, why aren't more people doing it? He said, because it takes too long. And I said, well, what does too long mean? He said, it'll take you about five years to reinvent yourself. And in the process, you're going to go broke. People are going to think you're crazy and you're going to, and everybody's going to question whether or not you really are on the right path. And, you know, I was national rookie of the year for Grubb and Ellis. I was, I was an up and coming star according to uh, different publications, but I decided in that moment that I was going to do that. And that, it, that it, if it was even possible to live an aligned life where I could live my core values and be successful, I wanted to do it. So I came back, tore my business plan up, that was a sales oriented plan and got involved in the community and started helping everybody that I could asking for nothing in return. Anybody that would meet with me in the business community, I just said, what can I do to help you? And half the time they were looking at me suspicious, like, what do you mean by that? Like help you how? Um, and I just said, whatever you need. So I was helping people get jobs. I was helping their kids get internships. I was helping them find doctors. I was helping them get business for themselves. And over time, just like he predicted, it took about five years in the process, all the things he predicted happened. Uh, all my partners at my old firm lost faith in me. My wife was even saying, hey, Jonathan, you know, you're, you're a reasonably smart guy. You work really, really hard. I know you really believe in this philosophy, but are you sure this is gonna make us money? Because when I look in the bank account, it looks pretty empty. And I just, and I just said, trust me, I'm up to something. Because I could just feel it. I could feel that what I was doing was having an impact and I could feel that long term, we were going to be able to uh, get something out of it. So um, after five years, just like he had predicted, I got my first uh, big referral, a company that uh, asked me to help them manage all of their real estate leases across the country. They had office and warehouse leases and uh, brought me in to help negotiate all the renewals, new leases, new extensions, et cetera. And I was like, wow, I didn't have to pitch. I didn't have to put a PowerPoint together. All I did was help somebody four years ago. I don't even remember doing it. And that person appreciated it so much that four years later, when he had an opportunity, he um, made this introduction for me. So that started this skyrocketing um, referral pipeline. And in the process too, which I write about in my book, I also went through my own personal reinvention where what I realized I hired a coach and what that coach helped me see is that while I was out helping people, what I was really trying to do, Kevin, is I was actually trying to just manipulate a little bit more of a creative way. Like I wasn't really serving to serve. I was keeping track. I was thinking, okay, I get it. I'm smart. If I help all these people, that's going to create this need in them to reciprocate. And over time, it'll all come back. It made sense logically. But what I wasn't doing is I wasn't coming from a pure place of, I just love these people and I just want to help them. And so when I saw that, I was horrified because I didn't realize I'd been such a fake and such a fraud for so long. And I decided, you know what? I'm not going to keep track. I'm not going to pay attention to who does what. I'm just going to love and serve everybody that I can and let the chips fall where they may and not keep track. And that's when it really took off because I think people can sense the uh, authenticity. So as I was doing this, I, it became harder and harder for me to build this type of selfless service model within a traditional commercial real estate brokerage firm that I was at. So in the middle of 2012, frustrated with how I felt like this model was being constrained under the typical ruthless environment, I, um, 
had an epiphany. I was in Sedona and it was one of those really surreal experiences where it's early in the morning, I'm meditating in the hot tub, nobody around, little snowflakes falling on my head. And I just had this epiphany where I realized, wow, Jonathan, you're thinking too small. What you stumbled on has the ability to actually transform the commercial real estate brokerage industry. If you can teach people how to do this and show them a real path and short circuit the timeline, right? Who, not very many people are going to be interested in going broke for five years and being laughed and scorned uh, to, to get to this level of success. And so I said, if I could figure out how to scale this, if I could figure out how to teach others how to do this, we could, we could really have an impact on the industry. So I got excited and I said, I'm going to change the industry. And then I thought even bigger. And I said, well, we're not the only ruthless industry in the world. I'm going to change the world. And I'm going to prove that you don't have to be ruthless to win which is actually the name of my book coming out on July 21st. So I, uh, we, we came back, I told my partners I was leaving. Um, and in that hot tub, I wrote a down a list of all the things that I hated about commercial real estate brokerage. And then I made a list of all the things that I wished were true about commercial real estate brokerage. Like if I could just create an idyllic universe of amazingness within commercial real estate brokerage, what would that look like? Like a utopian firm. And so I wrote all those things down. And out of that, we created our 15 core operating principles that we built our firm on. And today we've grown rapidly. We're now the largest uh, firm of our kind in the state of Arizona, one of the fastest growing in the country. Um, and everything is about culture for us. So we've created a culture of selfless service. And not only do we help office, industrial, retail, um, uh, uh, technology companies, aerospace companies, but we also uh, teach others. We've created the Kaiser Institute where we're now training other leaders how to create selfless cultures for themselves and for their own organizations. And we're creating a certification process where leaders, just like you go get an MBA or you go get a, a black belt in Six Sigma, we're creating that for culture so that leaders can say, hey, I'm Kaiser certified. And that means that I know how to go into organizations and create selfless cultures. And then we're designating organizations as well on how they can create cultures. And, and, and at, the old, at the end of the day, what we're about, Kevin, is proving that even in ruthless sales environments, that if you do the right thing and you focus on helping other people, you truly can have long-term sustainable success. But it's not the short game. Right? It's people that really want that long-term success. That's what we teach. And it's exciting to watch it really start to take off. Well, I really like that example that you gave not only, I mean, first off, Jonathan, that's an amazing story. Thank you. I'm fascinated by it. Uh, congrats to you, congrats to Kaiser. Um, and I really like what you said about the citrus tree. I mean, what you've been doing for these past five years is really watering that tree and growing that base. I mean, like any plant, like even bamboo, you, know, you water it for so long, you build those relationships and then you got this beautiful lush tree with these fruits. Now, the thing that's difficult with that, I'm sure with cultural leadership is, how do you do that so quick? It took you five years to do that. What are you looking for in your employees um, that you are hiring and how do you cultivate um, you know, that mindset? That is a really, really good question, Kevin. And that actually has been the biggest learning experience that I've had since launching the firm is because I was such a radical turnaround story, because I arguably was one of the most ruthless brokers out there. And then I switched to trying to be and then ultimately becoming arguably the most selfless out there. I thought, if I can do it, anybody can do it, which is true. But what I didn't account for is that you have to want to, and you have to really want to. Not just want to because it sounds cute and clever, but want to because you really want to serve others. And so one of the hardest parts about growing this firm has been having to say no to probably 80% of the people that approach me wanting to join us, you know, because they say, wow, these guys are really growing. They got the hot bat. Let me go join their firm. But most of the time, it's not because they want to be part of a culture of service. It's because they want the success that comes along with it. Right. So that's the first part is discernment. And we've done a lot of things that I can share with you offline or share with any of the listeners that want to, to, um, to hear more about it. We have a process and we have a guy that, that runs it all for us within Kaiser. 
But it's even harder when you're a service-based firm that's a bootstrapped at the time, you know, now, now we're, we're off to the races, but at the time self-funded the whole thing. Uh, and when you have producers that you're relying on their production to pay the rent and they're, and you've determined once they're already in that they're not living the values. My biggest learning experience was I tried too hard to convert them versus just understanding that if they wanted to, they would be doing it and providing them with a path. And so the first answer to your question, and I had to get rid of those people and that was painful, but that's where the rubber meets the road, right? When revenue's on the line, do you live your values or do you go with the revenue? So I decided that no matter what, I was going to live by my values. And as we um, parted ways with the folks that were misaligned, we've made up for it in spades by the vibrancy of the organization and, and, and how they flourish when that poisonous um, sort of culture element is out. But from my perspective, you have to A, look for the right kinds of people. That's the point of that. People that really want to be part of this kind of culture. And so we are very over the top on who we are. If you go to our website, kaiser.com, that's K-E-Y-S-E-R, by the way. A lot of people spell it K-A-I. It's K-E-Y-S-E-R dot com. You'll see that we put our values out there for everyone to see. So we're not like any other commercial real estate firm that talks about the capabilities and how great we are and look at all our big deals. We're talking about our culture and what we stand for and what our clients can, can, can count on from us. And so by being so over the top with our messaging, it has a magnetic effect where it rejects many of the wrong people and attracts many of the right people. And so part of the vision of this book is, you know, our, our vision is to be a billion dollar company that completely reinvents commercial real estate from the inside out, not through technology. And we have some pretty cool tech, but through culture and through proving that even in brokerage, if you do the right thing, take care of others, collaborate with your team members, et cetera, that you can have extraordinary success for yourself. And so that's the main point of my book. You don't have to be ruthless to win is to share that vision, right? Is to share the story and tell people how we have created a culture, like the how, how did we actually do it? I first tell my story in the first third of the book. And because I think people need to hear how I actually did it to believe that it's actually possible. And then we share exactly how we built the culture once we made the decision to launch the firm. And we share kind of the three levels of reinvention that are required for a person to be able to do that. It starts with the self. So self reinvention, you got to be the change you want to see in the world. Like Gandhi says, second level is your company culture. You have to create a culture within your organization of service. And then the third is your community. How are you acting in the community? If you know one of my good friends, John Mackey, who is the founder and CEO of Whole Foods and also wrote the book Conscious Capitalism, he talks about um, the stakeholder environment and making sure that all of your stakeholders in the organization um, are being treated the right ways. And so that for us becomes the key is getting the message out. And thank you for having me on because this is one of the ways that we're getting the message out and you have such a great following and people really respect who you are and who you be in the world. But I'm looking for people who want to be a part of something different that want to have an impact on the world. I think people are tired of just putting dollars in their pockets. People want more, especially this next generation, right? We, we're not content to just go to work every day, eight to five and come home. We want to have impact in the world. We want what we do to matter. And that's what we're about at Kaiser. For us, everything is about changing the world through selfless service. We want to change the business environment. We want to change the business community. We want to prove that by doing business the right way, you can have more success than less, right? It's, it's like we all know how to serve, Kevin. It's this weird thing. At our homes, with our kids, at our social clubs, at our churches, at our mosques, whatever, we're all taught to love and serve and give. And we all know how to do it because we do it with the people we care the most about. And then somehow there's this weird shift where then we forget all that when we get in our car to go to work and we show up, we put on our tough suit, we fight, 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 scratch, claw. And then we're exhausted from doing all that and we go home and we take that 
suit off and we put on our nice suit again. And my point is, why? why? Why do we feel like we have to live these separate lives? What if the same skills that we know how to do with our families, with our friends, what if we applied those same things? What if we loved everyone we came into contact with the same way we would treat our mother? Uh, assuming, of course, you love your mother like I do. What if you actually did that? And what if that could create extraordinary success? So I have a dream of a world where people actually selflessly serve each other, regardless of personal gain, understanding that it's in their own personal best interest to do so. So I believe that selfless is selfish. I believe that the most self-centered way to live is to serve others. Because the more I give, the more I get. I can't outgive the universe. So all I do is spend all my time and all our company does is going way above and beyond for people. We don't sell, we don't cold call, we don't do any of that stuff. We just love and serve everybody we come into contact with as best we can. We're not perfect, but we try our very hardest to do everything we can think of and 10 more for everybody that we can come into contact with. And then Those people are so blown away with all the stuff we do for them, (laughs) they spend their time trying to figure out how they can help us. And it becomes this amazing thing where instead of having to sell and convince and fight, we just serve, we just love, and the money comes with it. Well, Jonathan, it seems like you love to serve. I mean, you're not passionate about this at all. No, not at all. <laughs> I can really, I can really feel it from this side. You know, hundreds of miles away. You know that passion that you have for your company and your employees. And you're right. I mean, uh, in, in order to be selfless, you need to be selfish. It's also it's a conundrum in itself. Um, and actually, our guest uh, two days ago said the exact same thing. So I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and you were mentioning about how the the leadership values that you're working on your company, um, how how we all know how to how to serve. You made that a big point. Um, for for leadership, how have your transformative leadership that you've been able to teach translated um, to your uh, employees' home lives and your own personal life? Yeah, that's a, oh man. That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. I think service is a mindset that you don't take off, like you just said. So my philosophy here at Kaiser is a lot of people are here, one, because they love the culture, because it's safe. Because in most commercial estate brokerage environments, it is not safe. And you are looking over your shoulder all the time, locking your drawers, taking important phone calls in the car, fighting over deals every day. So one, it's just a safe environment and everybody's trying to help each other. So it's the absolute opposite dynamic of a traditional firm where everybody's trying to take from each other here. Everybody's like, Hey, how can I help you with that? And asking for nothing in return. But the, the biggest reason I hear why people love being here is because here we're all about personal development. So part of what service is for me is I want to help every one of my people become better because I believe that personal development. I just wrote this article for, um, uh, Oh, one of the, one of the publications, maybe it was ink. I can't remember <laughs> too many coming down the pike these days, but I think it was entrepreneur. I just, I just finished the article for an entrepreneur yesterday. And it was talking about how in, in everything that we do, if we have a focus on putting good into whatever we're doing and serving, then whatever we get out of it improves. And why would that be true outside of ourselves if it wasn't in true inside of ourselves? So I believe that the more I work on me, the better that I become, the more of a the more of my rough edges and my problem areas and my and my faults and my issues that I can address, the better that I can serve others and the more that I can love on others because my own issues aren't getting in the way. And so what a lot of people come to Kaiser for is they want to be better people. They want to be successful, of course, but they want to improve and they want to grow. And my goal, like Richard Branson says, is is to make everybody so good that they can happily leave, but they won't because they love it here. Right. So I'm trying to grow my people at traditional commercial state environments. You're trying to keep your people down because you don't want to believe you don't want to make too money to be self-sufficient. I want the opposite. I want my people to flourish. If they go start an, another entrepreneurial um, endeavor and leave Kaiser, great. That means I did my job of helping them. And when I, the, re, the way that we're able to short track that five years that I had to go through is when I was in that hot tub, I had an aha moment and I realized, oh my gosh, I know exactly what to do. I just go give everything away. 
I just prove what I've just do what I've just done inside the organization the same way I'm doing it outside the organization. So anybody that comes a part of Kaiser, any one of my contacts, any one of my relationships are theirs. And that's so unusual that it's 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 awesome to watch new people come over that aren't used to it, but want to believe in it, but aren't quite sure if it's true. And then I go, okay, what's your business line? Okay, what are the people you want to get into? How can I help you get into those? And they're looking at me like, wow, you're really doing this. And then when they start seeing the results of it, it's empowering for them. So the goal is find the right people that want to be part of this, right? Find the right clients who are looking for this and are sick and tired of traditional commercial real estate brokers who are screwing them right and left, heavily conflicted, et cetera and find those people that want to be part of the next generation commercial real estate firm that completely transforms commercial real estate through selfless service. And I like what you said too. I think you got to find the right people, but you also said it beforehand, the people will find you, the people that align their values with your company, they're going to find you. Um, Well, especially when I have friends like you that have such a great following. (laughs) We're trying to find you, Jonathan. I'm going to find you one way or another, man. You just watch. All right, brother. I'll be there. Um, but so, so Jonathan, obviously people want to gravitate towards this leadership. Um, you know, I, I spoke with a really wise leader and he said, I think the great, the greatest mark of a leader is that, um, they leave things better than they found it. What gives you the confidence that if you were to leave today or something were to happen to you, um, your company would be able to stay in, if, if not even do even better mm. long term. Yeah, it's a great question because as we start putting offices in other markets, right, that that same question applies is, is how do we have success if it's not this idea of I'm the face of the firm and I have to be and everything, which we're already way too big for us to be, for that to even be true. But I think it's very simple. It's the ideology. We're an idea. We're, 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 we're not a firm of tactical excellence and we have better tactical excellence than anybody I've ever heard of, but that's not what makes us so special. What makes us so special is we're an idea. We're an idea of a better way that things could be done. And so where there's a lot of speakers and there's tons of people who could get up and talk, who could write books, who could do research, there's not a lot of people who are in the trenches every single day particularly in in ruthless, ruthless industries, proving that, of course, everybody knows you could do the right thing. That's not a new philosophy. But the idea of do the right thing and not get trampled, that is a new philosophy. It's certainly in commercial real estate brokerage. I mean, there's no book like mine on the market, and mine is like a tell-all. You know, I have people that read it that go, whoa, JK, this is the, that's my nickname, by the way, JK. This is the bravest book I've ever read. Like, I can't believe how raw and authentic you are. So what I'm trying to do is truthfully save the commercial real estate brokerage industry, because I believe that in this next generation of technological change, of ideological change, I believe that if you're not focused on pushing more value across the table than you possibly can, then you're going to lose because you're going to be disrupted. And so part of it is I want to show people that this truly is possible within an environment that maybe most people don't think is possible so that they too can take these same ideas and go implement them in their in their business. And so that's why we've developed through the Kaiser Institute all these different modules, right? Toe in the water. We have an online course that you can just sign up for, go through yourself and get all the tools you'll need to do it yourself. If you want a, a little additional, you can gro- join a group program and be part of a group and have like a, a workshop type environment, a mastermind type environment. If you want even more, you can have one of our leaders come out and teach this in your corporate environment. If you want even more, you could have me potentially come out and, and speak to your people and help help it, it invent change. So for me, this is not about me. I just happen to be an example of someone who has done it. And so if I die, I mean, my four kids and wife will be pretty pretty bummed and and we wouldn't want that but if i died this idea is bigger than me right this idea is an idea of something that's not tied to an individual it's tied to a concept and we've already had enough proof of concept that 
people around the country and around the world are going, wow, those guys aren't a joke. They've actually figured something out. How do I do that? And so that's really what's catapulting our, 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 our growth. Interesting. You know, uh, our founder was in commercial real estate before starting the magazine. Uh, all my roommates in this house, they're all commercial real estate. And I think they have, you know, originally had that similar drive to what you, I want to have stuff. I want to have money, you know, I want to make that stuff. What advice would you give for them right now? I mean, they're, they're working the nine to five right now. You know, their industry is pretty cutthroat. Um, they've, you know, their, their, their company is all about saving costs and, you know, you know, all basically commission, uh, is how they're going to pay people. Um, they don't get taught, you know, transformative leadership. They don't get taught servant leadership, nothing like that. They come home, they, you know, they don't like their jobs, but they want money and they want to have that fast life. What advice would you give to them? Well, two things. Number one, I tried extraordinarily hard. And I'm a guy that likes to will things into action. I mean, I created this whole company from an idea, right? So I'm probably already in in a little bit of the unique percentage of bold. Most people wouldn't do what I did, take it all, roll it on black and say, by the way, I'm going to be a crazy visionary and, you know, entrepreneur. Most people aren't willing to take that level of risk or want to for that matter. And I'm not trying to even recommend it, but um, I think a couple, couple takeaways are number one, it's really, really, really hard to change a culture within an organization that behaves very different, particularly if you're not at the top of the food chain, right? If you're not the CEO, there's a statement, it's a fish rots from the head, right? So if you're not the CEO leader of an organization that could have transformative change across the organization, you're going to get incredibly frustrated and trampled within a traditional organization as I once was trying to do this. So that's part of why I created Kaiser was to create an alternative for people that wanted to be part of this, that wanted to learn. That's why we created the Kaiser Institute to teach others. And so the first thing I would say is you have to know the, the three step transformative process is self culture community. Right. So you first have to work on yourself. That's self-improvement. I got stuff for that. You can email me offline and I can share that with you. But second thing is you really got to be thinking about what, where do you want to be? What flag do you want to be bearing? Does your flag stand for the things that you want to stand for? And are you going to be constantly the salmon swimming upstream working for a traditional firm? Or do you want to be part of that next generation firm? And so for those, for those commercial real estate brokers out there that are thinking, wow, I'd love to learn more about this. I'd love to be a part of it. You know, we're, we're doing a national expansion rollout right now. So there's always opportunities for people to join us. But even if that wouldn't be a good fit or doesn't make sense, that self reinvention journey in my book, I describe exactly how you could do it for yourself. You could take one of the Kaiser Institute courses and learn that. But at the end of the day, it takes a commitment on your part because there's going to become a day where you start going, man, that sound, that guy was sounded so compelling when I listened to him, I got all excited. This is harder than I thought. So if I'm making anybody think that this is easy, hear me. This is not for the faint of heart. This is not easy. You have to go against the grain. You have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to make fun of. Commercial real estate brokerage is a very tight fraternity. I'm not in that fraternity anymore, right? I'm an outsider going, here's what's wrong with that fraternity and here's how we can do it a different way. So it takes somebody who's going to be courageous. It takes somebody who's willing to do it when they don't feel like doing it. It takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. So you got to be really willing to commit to it for the long long run. But when you do, I cannot tell you, Kevin, how cool it is to not have to worry where our business opportunities are coming from every day, like most brokers have to, because they're actually incoming. That is a very unique kind of thing. There are there are pockets, right? There's, there's people that have done this. It's not like I'm the first. There are individuals within various organizations that have lived this quietly, selflessly, not really sharing much about it, but they just embodied it. And they've had varying levels of success. So what I'm trying to do is say, hey, why are there so few and what if we could teach everyone how to do it? And so that's the vision. So the vision is plug in, join the community, get involved, whether you join us as a broker, whether you get trained, whether you go through the Institute, whether you have us come into your organization, help you revamp your model, 
whatever it is, you need to be in a position to be willing to commit. And that commitment is a long-term commitment, not just some short-term, I read this book, I'm gonna try it for 30 days and then I'm gonna be on to the next thing. Right, exactly, which is, is really hard. You know, there's an analogy with people, um, you know, running up a mountain. You know, most people will stop halfway and the ones that wanna keep running are gonna make it to the top and have that glorious view. I mean, you're a living example of that, uh, you know, in my opinion. So um, I'm just blown away by everything that you've been able to do. And it all started with an idea. Well, it all started with an epiphany in a hot tub. You have your epiphanies in hot tubs, I have my epiphanies, you know, somewhere else. <laughs> With a cold tub? That's hot these days. I gotta ask it. Was that rubber duck in that hot tub next year right there? No, but the rubber duck is a very special. This is our mascot, the duck. And if you go to uh, Kaiser.com, you can download. We have a, a cool little printout, and it's also in the book. So if you go to, uh, if, you, if you buy my book, you don't have to be ruthless to win. Uh, we'll talk about it. But basically why we're the duck is because when we got into our first, our very first office space was this shared office space where <laughs> this very sweet architectural firm, because we had no money. I mean, we were a startup that I'd self-funded out of my, you know, out of my personal funds. And they gave us space in the back of their office and somebody left a little rubber duck like this size around. And uh, we started tossing it back and forth each other and then when we got our new hq which is a big open environment very collaborative it uh, we realized that if you throw these ducks around it doesn't break anything you can get people's attention and so it just it, it just spiraled into this thing and the other reason is because if you think about a duck one when you're doing something different you have to be willing to take flack and so if you think about the down on a duck's back right so as the as the rain and the sleet and whatever hits them, it just rubs off them. So we try to think of ourselves like that: is we expect to be criticized, we expect for people to not get what we're up to, and that's okay. We're like the duck. The other thing about it is, we're chill on the surface and furiously pumping underneath, right? So we're just all chill and happy and fun, lighthearted. Like every time I see the duck, it just reminds me, dude. Principle nine: we're lighthearted and playful in all that we do, we're fun with what we do, and with the members of the team but underneath we are furiously pumping. So it really has become the embodiment of our lighthearted culture, but serious about what we're doing, not taking ourselves too seriously. And we have thousands around the office and they kind of annoy some of the people, but I don't care because we love our ducks. Love it, I love that. Yeah, we got plenty of ducks up in Oregon, that's for sure. Um, well, so Jonathan, this has been a great conversation today. Uh, I'd like to tell you more about the ducks too. I got a connection down in Phoenix. Uh, in Ohio, we do a rubber duck regatta every year. My grandpa started it. Big I'm in. Event. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But uh, uh, so you've been mentioning a lot about, you know, your original motivation to get stuff. And then now it's, you know, to, to transform commercial real estate. And you mentioned, you know, our mission is to be a billion dollar company, you know, you know 20 minutes ago, be a billion dollar company that, trans, that transforms real estate. Now, those are two different things. Which one's more important to you? Yes. Yes. Because here's the coolest part about what we're up to. The whole point of my firm is to prove that you can have success through service. So no one would give two craps about us if we're out speaking, speaking this stuff and teaching this stuff and living this stuff and nobody hires us. So for us, there's a direct correlation between the proof concept of people seeing that you can have success this way and living into that and change the business world. That's what changes the business world. Without the success, no one cares because we're yet another idea that was just a, you know, passing trend. But at the end of the day, and the reality is, this is the greatest and oldest business principle of all time, right? I mean, I have a cool wall in my, in my uh, community room where I have all these leaders across time, from Martin Luther King to Mother Teresa to Moses and to Socrates, and all these people say the same thing. The more you give, the more you get. So if I'm just talking give and go broke, I don't think you'd even be having me on this podcast. No one would care. Right. What I'm saying is we're going to be a billion dollar company doing it the right way. 
And that success will in and of itself cause others to want to learn more about our ideology and our philosophy and our methodologies. So for us, they're intrinsically tied. And I think that's one of the problems with a lot of the messaging out there around service and giving. I think even the idea of the word, I don't even like this word, but servant leadership almost has like this creepy, like religious Catholic guilt sort of like, you know, yeah, it's like, you know, I'm sorry. I did something wrong yet again. It's like, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about giving so we can go broke. We're talking about helping others so that we could be successful and help others be successful. They help us be successful. What a cool world that will be. That's what we've created in Arizona. That's what we're looking to create as we roll out across the country. And that's why for us, they're so intrinsically tied. I love that. I love that a lot. And uh, you know, we like to say, you know, the billionaires nowadays impact a billion lives. Um, and so that's what we really, we really like to show. And obviously have guests like you on the, on the show to exemplify that. Um, because my big thing is like, you know, Jeff Bezos passes away, passes away today. No one's going to give a shit. It's like, he made a lot of money. You know, he did a lot of cool things, a lot of jobs. But, you know, if someone like a Jane Goodall were to pass away today, a Leo DiCaprio were to pass away, it'd be completely different. Um, so that's what people are tuning into, especially on, on our end of things. Well, and one of the things I love about this, you know, the, the, the generations I'm, I'm X generation. Most of my people are either X or uh, millennials. One of the things that I love about millennials get a bad rap, by the way, like millennials are some of the coolest people in the world. Um, They care, you know, I mean, they actually care. They want to have impact. So for me, it's like, at the end of the day, if you, if you wait until you're 60 to go, Hmm, now do I start thinking about, does my life matter? And what am I going to do? What am I going to do to give back? It's kind of late. Yeah. The cool thing about our, 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 our methodology, our philosophy, our, what we're up to is you don't have to have this sort of, I'm going to work really hard and fight and scratch and claw for 40 years. And then I'm going to have enough money to go give it all away and serve and help. It's like, what if you could integrate those and do them at the same time? And so for me, what I love about the next generations is that they care about impact. And it's not just about bottom line. It's about it's about being part of something bigger than themselves and having true, meaningful impact on the world. And so when I look at me and I say, what's my role in history? I just want to be one of the few people that said, hey, all these leaders that said this stuff is actually true for thousands and thousands of years, hmm, maybe they're not idiots. Right. And maybe maybe they knew a little bit of something about something. And maybe I should lean into that philosophy and maybe I should teach others to do the same thing. So if I even just have a slight little impact on others saying, wow, if that's possible for that crazy guy, maybe it's possible for me, that would be amazing. But the ultimate impact for me would be to see a world where, you know, my goal is to create a world. I've created a world here within Kaiser and within our community here, but I want to create a world where everybody's out to help each other. Imagine how much could be done. Imagine the problems we could solve. You know, I don't think there's a higher calling out there. What higher calling could there be than I want to change the nature of human interaction within the thing that they do the most time within work. Right? What if everybody around work was focused on serving, giving, helping? And what if they were doing it not because they just happened to be one of the few that were blessed to be altruistic, like my parents who just are wired that way, not like me, but because they actually believed that it was in their best interest to do so. So that's what we're teaching. That's what we're living. That's what we're delivering to clients. And I think that that is going to be the thing that creates the billion dollar organization that has the impact in the world. And I want my kids, my kids today, you know, people ask them what I do. They don't say commercial real estate. They say, my dad is changing the world. And I love that. And and you're completely right. And it will happen. And that's why we need leaders like you, you know, to lead the way. So Jonathan, the last question I got for you is, is what is your definition of a real leader? You know, for me, my favorite book still on leadership is Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. I think that to me, that's the embodiment. 
right? It's, it's the one that puts it forward. I try to live that. I'm not saying I always do, but that's what I really try to be here. I try to care more about others than I care about myself. I try to put myself last. I try to think, you know, I don't, I'm not talking about taking care of my health and all that. I mean, obviously you got to take care of yourself, but I mean, in everything that I do, my goal is always to give more. My goal is always to serve more. I want to, I want to give more than I receive. I want to serve more than is expected. And if I do that with my people, if I do that with my family, if I do that with my friends, if I do that with my community, if I do that with everyone that I touch, it has this amazing impact of people wanting to follow you. Back in the day when I was Mr. Ruthless, I thought I was a badass and I wondered why nobody was following me. It's because I was a dick, right? Nobody wants to follow a selfish dick. That's not a leader, but I think there's this mindset in leadership that you have to be strong and you can't, you can't be vulnerable. And, you know, I love being vulnerable. I love telling all the ways that I screw up and it's a lot, but that's what makes me authentic. That's what makes me real. And that's what makes people want to be a part of what we're building. And so to me, a real leader is honest. They're authentic and they care so much about you as either their client, as their member of their team, or even as just in their home that they, that they, they make it obvious that they want what's in your best interest. And it's little things sometimes too, Kevin, that can be so meaningful. Like it's the little things where you're just paying attention. Like if you're in a meeting and somebody's water glass goes dry, you know, an old leader would be like, Jane, get some water in here. Right. That's not a leader. Leader gets up, goes, Oh my gosh, your glass is empty. Can I grab you some water? Go grab some water, bring it back. It seems so basic and simple, but it's like, wow, you're, you're, you don't have ego. You're not saying I'm better than this receptionist out here or, or that's below me. It's like, no, you're so about that person that whatever they need, you want to help them with. That mindset to me is what makes a great leader. And again, you know, Jonathan, you're spot on with what you've been saying this entire conversation and back to just watering that citrus tree. You know, you're building that base and everything that you've done in those five years of just eating it and that serving others has led to your mindset and that mindset shift now. So I'm excited to read this book. I've got to read it. I'm going through the process right now. You know, eating shit for a year, you know, it's tough. You know, all my friends, commercial real estate, you know, they're making more, but at the same time, uh, you know, they're, they're coming home and I'm just just watering that tree, man. I'm just watering that tree. Just getting I love it, man. So I'm a, I, I got to read your book, man. I'm excited. So again, one more time for our audience. Uh, what's the title of it and where can they find it? The title is You Don't Have to Be Ruthless to Win, and it will be live July 1st, or I'm sorry, July 21st, and you can get it on Amazon. Um, we'll all have it in audible format, we'll have it in ebook format, um, and for anybody that's interested in, um, in learning more about the book itself or about how you know, we can help on the Kaiser Institute side, uh, if you can go to ruthlessbook.com. Um, and so Ruthless Book is the website for the book. Uh, the name of my company, again, is Kaiser. And you can go to kaiser.com, K-E-Y-S-E-R, and you can find out more about that, about the Institute. Um, but at the end of the day, we're here to serve. So we have a lot of free stuff. We have a lot of ways that we can help. If we can be of service to anyone out there, um, you know, we... We want to, we want to have real impact. You know, I think a lot of people out there, they think they, they, they want to do the right thing. They want to have an impact, but they don't know how they don't know how, and they don't know if it's possible. That's what we're here to change. So if we can help you in any way along those lines, uh, we'd be delighted to do so. Absolutely. We'll, we'll talk later. Well, folks, ruthlessbook.com, go to ruthlessbook.com and also get yourself a hot tub and maybe a duck too. Um, but at least one day. At least one. Jonathan Kaiser, thanks for coming on the show today. Looking forward to uh, future conversations, and I'm going to find you, man, next time you're in Phoenix. Watch you out. You got it, brother. You know how to find me. Heart of Old Town. All right, all right. All right, Jonathan, appreciate your time again. Uh, and, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch, all right? Love and serve. Love and serve. Are you working your dream job? Well, neither were we. That's why we traveled the world find the individuals who are. This is who we found. These are their stories. These are your shortcuts.